always transfer energy without transferring matter. Longitudinal waves are those in which the direction of the oscillations is parallel to the direction of energy transfer, that is the direction the wave is going. In these waves, particles bunch up, we call those compressions, and when they're spread out, we call those rarefactions. Transverse waves are those in which the direction of oscillations is perpendicular to the direction of energy transfer. We can represent any wave, including longitudinal waves, like this. We call this a waveform. Displacement is up the y-axis, basically just how far the particles have oscillated from their original position, and it can be either distance or time on the x-axis. The peak of a wave is called the amplitude, it's the maximum displacement from equilibrium. If it's distance on the x-axis, one complete wave here gives you the wavelength. We give this the symbol lambda for short, but it's measured in meters. If it's time on the x-axis instead, one complete wave gives you the time period. This is the time it takes for one complete wave to pass. Frequency, on the other hand, is how many waves pass a point every second. The unit is hertz. Frequency is equal to 1 over time period. F equals 1 over T. You can often be asked to find frequency from a waveform like this. Measure the time period, then do 1 divided by that. Easy. The wave equation is this. V equals F lambda. That's wave speed equals frequency times wavelength. It's worth remembering that visible light wavelengths vary from around 400 to 750 nanometers, or 4 to 7.5 times 10 to the minus 7 meters, with red light having the longest wavelength and blue the shortest. The intensity of a wave is proportional to the amplitude squared. That means that if the amplitude doubles, the intensity quadruples. When light waves move from one medium to another, say from air to glass, they change speed. In this case, the wave slows down and the wavelength also decreases. A change in medium also results in a change in direction. This is called refraction. That is, if it's at an angle to the normal, the line we draw perpendicular to the surface. If light slows down, it moves closer to the normal. So that means that the angle of refraction is smaller than the angle of incidence. Now, all of these angles are measured from the normal. How much a medium refracts light is determined by its refractive index, symbol N. It's just a ratio that's equal to the speed of light in a vacuum, basically the same for air, divided by the speed of light in the medium. So it will be a number that's always greater than 1. If you calculate sine i over sine r for a light ray entering a medium from air, this happens to also give us the refractive index. The full equation for refraction is Snell's law. n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2. You can see that we've just replaced i and r with thetas. Bear in mind that in reality, the refractive index of a material varies with wavelength. Blue light's refractive index will always be higher than red light's for the same medium. That means that it refracts more than red. That's why white light undergoes dispersion when it passes through a prism. Let's say the light ray is coming out of the glass block and into air. Now, if we keep increasing this angle of incidence, eventually we'll end up with an angle of refraction of 90 degrees. That light ray will be going along that boundary, along the surface. The angle of incidence is now equal to what we call the critical angle, and that's going to be different for every medium. If we make the angle of incidence even bigger than the critical angle, that means that no light is going to be refracted out of the block. Instead, all light is reflected back inside. By the way, we always get some reflection, but now we have total internal reflection. Want to calculate the critical angle? Well, you can start with Snell's law. You call theta 1, theta c instead, make n2 90 degrees, and we end up with sine theta c equals n2 over n1. This, incidentally, is how optic fibers or fiber optics work. The basic optic fiber is a glass core surrounded by a protective sheath. The issue is that this will have a higher refractive index than the core, so TIR would not happen if it were not for the extra layer called the cladding that is in between them. It has a lower refractive index than the core, so TIR can occur. One of the issues with optic fibers is the fact that light will diverge, spread out as it travels down a fiber. This means rays can take different paths and therefore different times to reach the other end. This is called modal or multipath dispersion, and it results in pulse broadening. If pulses are stretched too much, they start to overlap as the next one has started to arrive before the first one has completed its journey. Your data's a goner. To mitigate this, we can do a few things. Number one, make the fiber really thin. The thinner it is, the less light will diverge. Number two, put repeaters in every so often to retransmit the slightly broadened pulses as brand new ones. The final clever idea is to use graded index fibers.
Lenses use refraction to make rays of light converge or diverge. A convex lens can make rays converge. If rays enter parallel to what we call the principal axis, for example, the light from an object very far away, the lens will make the rays converge at this point here. This is called the principal focus. The distance from the center of the lens is called the focal length. This doesn't change for a lens, and we can draw it on both sides, and you'll see why in a bit. However, light doesn't usually come from objects infinitely far away, but from objects a little bit nearer. The object could be anything, but we often represent it with just an arrow. Convex lens can then project an image using the light that comes from the object, but we only consider the light coming from the top of the object. And we can do that by drawing two rays. One always goes straight through the center of the lens, and one goes parallel into the lens, then through the principal focus. Where these two rays meet is where the image is formed. That's where you want your projector screen or retina or camera sensor to be in order to get a clear image formed. You'll also notice that the image is smaller than the object, so we say it's diminished. It's also upside down, so we say it's inverted. Things get a bit trickier when the object is very close to the lens. Now the rays don't meet, the image can't be projected. However, if we extrapolate the two rays back behind the lens, they do meet. We can draw the image here. And we can say that it's magnified, it's upright, but it's virtual. That means that it can't be projected. This would be what a magnifying glass does, for example. Your eye can deal with this diverging light accordingly to make it focus on your retina, but that means that you see this magnified virtual image, so things appear bigger. Concave lenses always diverge light rays, so they always produce a virtual image. With these, our line parallel in goes back through the other principal focus behind the lens. Where it meets the other ray is where the virtual image is. A couple more equations for lenses. The power of a lens is just the reciprocal of focal length. We give it the unit diopter. For lenses, we should probably say thin lenses used together, total power is equal to the sum of individual powers. The full lens equation is this. One over F equals one over U plus one over V. Light emitted from the sun oscillates in all orientations. However, if you have a polarizing filter made of very small lines, it only lets half of the light through. Only half is transmitted. The other half is absorbed. This is because it only lets waves of certain orientations through. We say that if the lines are vertical, waves oscillating vertically are absorbed, while horizontally orientated waves are transmitted pass through, and vice versa. Waves between vertical and horizontal are transmitted or absorbed according to their angle. It's very complicated in reality, but put simply, the light is now polarized and the intensity of the light is halved. Put another polarizing filter at 90 degrees behind the first and all of the light is absorbed. A normal wave is what we call a progressive wave. The wave moves while the medium or particles just oscillate around a point, say up and down. Two points one wave apart are said to be in phase. They're doing the same thing at any time. We say their phase difference is zero or 360 degrees, as we can represent wave cycles as circles. We can also split circles, and therefore cycles, into radians instead of degrees. There are two pi radians in a circle, so again, the phase difference of these two points is two pi radians. Like we said, that's the same thing as zero. Points on opposite sides of a wave are completely out of phase, or we might say in antiphase. They're half a wave out of phase, so their phase difference is 180 degrees, or pi radians. These two points are a quarter of a wave out of phase, so that's a phase difference of 90 degrees, or pi over 2 radians. We generally don't give phase differences above 180 degrees, pi radians, as we can just give the opposite phase difference, so 270 degrees is just given as 90 degrees, etc. Any phase difference can be calculated as a fraction times the total in a cycle. So we can do the distance between two points divided by the wavelength, or time difference between two points divided by the time period, depending on what graph we're given. Then we just multiply by 360, or 2 pi, depending on whether we want the phase difference in degrees or radians. When two progressive waves traveling in opposite directions meet, they undergo superpositioning. They are superposed. When these waves have identical frequency and wavelength, a stationary wave is formed. The points at which the resulting wave doesn't move is called a node. That's because the displacements are always summing to zero at these points. We call this destructive interference, so the amplitude is zero. At a node, no energy is transferred. At all other points, the resulting wave will oscillate due to constructive interference. 
where the amplitude is a maximum, these are called anti-nodes. We can see this if we attach a string under tension to a vibration generator. The wave is sent down the string and it reflects at the pulley and these two waves interfere. The simplest stationary wave looks like this. We call this the first harmonic or the fundamental. One loop, one anti-node and a node at both ends. We have half a wave on the string, so that means L equals lambda over two. The frequency of this is given by the equation one over two L, like the string, times root T over mu. T being the tension in newtons, which is usually the weight of the masses hanging on the end, and mu being the mass per unit length of the string. So that's in kilograms per meter. Incidentally, root T over mu actually gives you the wave speed. Double this fundamental frequency and we get the second harmonic. L equals lambda in this case, third harmonic, L equals one and a half lambda, and so on. Stationary waves can also be formed in tubes of air. At a closed end, a node must be formed, at an open end, an antinode. We can represent the stationary wave much like we do for a string. Just bear in mind that the first harmonic is likely to be different than that of the string because one or two of the ends are probably going to be open. Unlike progressive waves, points on stationary waves can only ever be completely in phase or completely out of phase. It just depends on if they're the same side of equilibrium or not. That's because two points above equilibrium will reach their own different amplitude at the same time, and they'll both reach equilibrium at the same time too. Even if waves aren't traveling in opposite directions, they still interfere when they meet. Thomas Young put a thin slit next to a candle to first ensure that the light used for the experiment was coherent. All of the light was in phase. But the definition of coherent is this actually. All waves have a constant phase difference. This light then passed through a double slit. The result was bright and dark fringes appearing on the screen, called these maxima and minima. We have a central maximum because those two rays meeting have traveled the same distance, so therefore they interfere constructively. The dark fringes or minima are due to the light from the two slits traveling slightly different distances to each other. We say their path difference is half lambda. That means that they arrived 180 degrees completely out of phase and interfered destructively, canceling each other out. The first bright fringe from the central fringe is a result of the path difference being the same as the wavelength lambda. That means that these arrive in phase two, interfering constructively, resulting in a bright fringe. The next dark fringe was the result of the path difference being one and a half lambda, and so on. Young's double slit equation is this, W equals lambda D over S, where W is the fringe spacing, that's the distance between the center of two bright fringes or two dark fringes, for example. D is the slit to screen distance, and S is the slit separation. Note that, that isn't slit width. Changing the actual width of the slits doesn't change the fringe width at all. However, this equation is an approximation and it can only be used when the screen distance is much, much larger than the slit separation. That's why the equation is likely to break down when we use sound instead. If you have two speakers producing the same waves in phase, if you walk at right angles to them, you'll hear the volume fluctuate as you go through maxima and minima. We can represent the pattern by drawing a graph of intensity against distance from the central max. The intensity falls away gradually and they all have the same spacing. But light can also diffract when you just use a single slit, as diffraction occurs at both edges of the slit. It gives this diffraction pattern instead, the two differences being that the intensity falls away quicker and the central max is double the width of the subsequent fringes. Don't forget that if you do this in reality, it's always more accurate to measure 10 fringes than divide by 10 to get W. When we do the experiment, we're probably going to use a laser as it provides coherent light that's also monochromatic, just one wavelength is emitted, resulting in clearly defined fringes. However, using a candle that emits a spectrum of wavelengths, Young saw the white light splitting into the different colors. As red light has the longest wavelength, it diffracts the most, so it could be seen on the outside edge of the fringes. Blue light has the shortest wavelength, so it diffracts the least, so it can be seen on the inside edge of the fringes. If you replace Young's double slit with a grating of very small lines separated by line spacing little d, you only get constructive interference at a few points very far away from the central max. We call these orders instead of fringes. The central max is the zeroth order. As we're dealing with large angles, we can't use Young's double slit equation, so we use the more accurate equation, n lambda equals d sine theta. Often you'll be given the line or grating spacing in lines per millimeter, which you need to turn into meters, essentially meters per line is the reciprocal, before it can go into the equation. You can also be asked to find the maximum visible order. In this case, we want to find out what order is made at 90 degrees. 
sine 90 equals 1, so n equals d over lambda. Let's say this ends up being 3.8. There's no such order, so only orders up to 3 are visible. Also, they might try to catch you out by asking, hey, how many orders will be visible, rather than what is the highest order? In this case, you have to count the orders on both sides, including the zeroth order. So that will be 7 in this case. Very cheeky. Just be careful, with some multiple choice questions involved in this equation, you might get asked what will happen to the orders if the wavelength is halved, say. In this case, you don't look at theta at all, as it's not proportional to anything in the equation. Instead, we say n is inversely proportional to lambda. If lambda halves, n doubles. That means that what was the first order is now the second order, and a new first order is created between it and the zeroth order. If d is changed, we say n is proportional to d. Leave a like if you found this helpful. I've also put together these into videos that cover whole papers to help you revise for your exams more effectively. Click on the card for your board if it's there, or go to my channel for more, including international boards.